Good evening. It's time to get started here. Glad to see everybody out tonight and all those are viewing at home. We're glad that you're with us. First song tonight will be 745. And the first verse is this. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Sing all three verses of this song. Time is filled with swift transition. No. Second verses. <laughs> Now 
to come tonight and sing praises to you, Lord, and the opportunity to hear questions from your word and those be answered to the best the ability that they can be. And we actually please help us take something from that to apply in our lives, Lord, that we may share with others. And we thank you for this beautiful weather you blessed us with, Lord, and we just thank you for all your creation you blessed us with. And we ask you to please be the number, our number for sick tonight, and Lord, we ask you to please help them get back to their once appointed health, Lord. And we ask you to please be with our number who are traveling in our forces and we ask you please keep them safe. And Lord, we ask you please be with our government in this trying time and help them to work off your basis and the principles of your word, Lord. And we just thank you for all the blessings you give us each and every day. In your holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you want to mark the invitation song, it'll be 947. Jesus is tenderly calling me home. Before the lesson, let's stand and sing 968. Oh, they tell me of a home. Sing the first and last verse of this song. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of Everybody watch his feet are going to dangle when he gets in this chair. <laughs> we are uh, glad that you are uh, here tonight. Uh, we got some new furniture uh, since the last time we did this. Um, <clears throat> Caleb is a, a master of, of style and making things look good. And so he, he found this and set it up for us so that we could be a little more casual and, uh, and uh, be seated together and share some thoughts with you. I know you want to say something. Go ahead. I'm also the master of cheap, so these came from Facebook Marketplace. I don't think we spent a lot of money on 
on stuff like this. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to respond to your short jokes. So. <laughs> Well, not jokes if they're true, but anyhow, uh, I will tell you a story about this table and chairs, though, while we have a minute. So um, Caleb did find these. They were, they were very cheap, and um, he, he asked me, since they were in Jasper, if I would go and pick them up. And so I did, and Damien Baker went with me, and we went to get them, and they were in Bent Tree. And when um, we got a text from the guy about them, he said, my driveway is kind of steep. When he said this driveway was kind of steep, it was not an exaggeration. And I was thinking steep this way, and it was steep this way. And so uh, I got the truck down there and backed it, and after a lot of maneuvering around, we got it and got to the top. And then Caleb sent me a message and said, by the way, the guy said he would have brought that stuff to the top of the hill if you'd ask him to. <laughs> but, uh, but we got it, and, and all's well that ends well, and we, we had an adventure. Um, this is one of my favorite things that we do, questions and answers. Um, it gives us a chance to deal with some of the things that you guys have on your mind, some of the studying that you have been involved in, and it uh, gives us a chance to explore some of those things. And so that's what we're going to do just for a little bit tonight. And I'm actually going to um, take the first question, and this is a really good one. Um, why is Jesus called the Rose of Sharon? And I, I could not answer this question without us singing at least the first verse. Who knows the song, Jesus, Rose of Sharon? A couple people. Will, do you care to pull that up? And we'll, we're going to sing the first verse of this, and then we'll explore this question a little bit. <clears throat> Jesus, Rose of Sharon, bloom within my heart, beauties of thy truth and holiness. Impart that where'er I go, my life may shed abroad fragrance of the knowledge of the love of God. Jesus, rose of shed. That's one of those old, old ones. I remember uh, my grandparents uh, singing that song. And so, why is Jesus called the Rose of Sharon? Now, let me answer this the short way, and then I'll answer the long way. The short way is, I don't really know. Um, but the long answer actually comes all the way back in your Old Testament from the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. So, we're going to Take our Bibles and we're going to blow the dust off of that page in your Bible, the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, depending what translation you have. Go ahead and turn there. We are not um, going to get into a detailed exposition of the book of Song of Solomon tonight. If you've never read Song of Solomon, read it this evening and you will understand why I'm not interested in getting into a detailed exposition of the book of Song of Solomon this evening. Um, there are a lot of questions that remain unanswered about this particular text um, and, uh, and we will not get into detail, but this is where we find the phrase, the Rose of Sharon. Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, chapter two, verse one, this is, um, these are the words of Solomon's, uh, one of Solomon's favorite wives, arguably his favorite wife. And uh, it says this, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Now, um, both of those are expressions that we have heard to talk about Jesus. Uh, the other one you may be familiar with. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul, the lily of the valley. So here we see these two expressions that have become songs, the rose of Sharon, the, the lily of the valley. And if you turn your Bible over to Acts chapter 9, you're going to see this again. Acts chapter 9.
By the way, if you have your Bible with you, hold it up for me, please. Bible, phone, tablet. All right, good job. Acts chapter 9 and uh, verse 35 says, All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. And uh, it talks about the next verse, uh, Tabitha being in Joppa. So, let me say this a, a couple of ways. Sharon is a place. Um, Sharon is a place. If you look in the um, back of your Bibles in those maps, uh, it's, it's a valley. And you'll see it's surrounded by mountains, as a valley typically is. And Sharon is a, a valley there. Um, it's near the port of Joppa. And it extends about 15 miles. And you can actually see it on the map. It'll show you where it is. A, a very distinct landmark of Palestine. And there, uh, uh, it was a very fertile place. And so, flowers probably grew. Interestingly, a rose, as we think about a rose, as in uh, what we buy our wives on Valentine's Day or for anniversaries and all that, that's not really... That wouldn't grow there. Uh, there's a, a, a large debate among people that are a lot more interested in it than me about what the actual flower, the Rose of Sharon, would have been. What we do probably know is that it would have been a flower that was both uh, visually appealing and had some sort of healing properties. And so, certainly when you think about Jesus, we don't think about him being visually appealing, but as Jesus is known to us for the things that he's done, he would certainly have those healing regenerative, regenerative powers. Uh, he would be uh, important to us. And so this could be a great nickname uh, for Jesus. Uh, another theory that has been proposed is that the Song of Solomon is not just a love story between Solomon and his wife, but it is um, uh, supposed to be uh, representative of Jesus and the church. And in, of course, uh, Ephesians 5, we read that Jesus is the groom and, and the church is the bride presented to Christ. So, problematic in that is if we're thinking of Jesus being the groom, well, the rose of Sharon, the wife is saying that I am the rose of Sharon. And so, Long story short, here's the answer to this question. I think that what was done a long, long time ago by some very well-intentioned people was that they plucked that phrase, Rose of Sharon, and thought about the Rose of Sharon being a beautiful flower, um, being something that has healing powers, being something that's special and unique, and they likened Jesus to that Rose of Sharon, and they likened Christ to uh, the Lily of the Valley. But I don't think there is a lot of theological significance to that title. And when we sing songs like Jesus, the Rose of Sharon, Bloom Within My Heart, I think it's just another way to think about Christ. I think about the song Paradise Valley. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare to those flowers that bloom in the garden above. It's just another way to help us think about how Jesus is wonderful and great and, and superior. And so, Sharon uh, is, a, is a place in Palestine. It was very significant. We can see both in Old and New Testament times. Um, and, and Jesus just took on that nickname, Rose of Sharon, as something that's beautiful and healing and, and wonderful. And so, uh, that, that is the answer to that question, Brother Caleb. I, I think you answered it uh, as correctly as we can. Um, just a kind of a side note, sometimes we get caught up and people think that the songs in our uh, songbooks are inspired, and they're not. They're poetic license, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they reference many biblical things, otherwise we probably shouldn't be singing them. Uh, and there, there are some songs that have some questionable lyrics in it and that we have to examine and see if they're in line with Scripture. Uh, and, and so, um, the songs that we sing and, and whether or not they're... Uh, Within, you know, sometimes we get it so used and accustomed to saying something or hearing a phrase that it just becomes, well, that must be somewhere in Scripture. Uh, now, the Psalms, uh, many of the Psalms that David wrote are turned into songs that we sing today. And they're usually uh, in our songbooks, there will be Scripture references by the song. Uh, and, and most of them have some sort of Scripture reference with them. But uh, again, um, it just sort of vague references to Jesus being the Rose of Sharon, and uh, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, right on. All righty, question number two, Caleb. I'm going to put you on the spot here for a minute. Um, all the way back in Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu lose their lives because they offered strange fire to the Lord. Caleb, what was that strange fire, and why was it so displeasing to the Lord? You like verses that we don't know the answers to all the questions, don't you? That's right. Uh, on questions and answers. If we go to Leviticus chapter 8, uh, there is the consecration 
of Nadab and Abihu uh, and Aaron as the um, basically the high priests. And uh, in chapter 8, uh, there's this whole big ceremony where they go through the process of anointing them. Uh, Moses uh, takes the, the blood of uh, the sacrifice and um, puts it on them and puts it on their ears and uh, puts a, a special uh, turban on their heads that have a, uh, a, a plate or a placard on it. Um, they're, they're given special robes. Uh, and, and so there's this big ritual that puts them in a position of importance to the people. We don't know how old Nadab and Abihu were, uh, but it would uh, appear uh, that they have obviously a very short period of time from chapter 8 to chapter 10 and verse 1 uh, where they are killed by the Lord. Um, if you look there in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now Nadab, uh, let's see, I've got the verses there. Um, now Nadab, oh, too fast. Let's see. There we go. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid it on the uh, uh, an incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Now you notice there in, in my translation it says uh, unauthorized fire. Uh, in the King James and many of the other translations it will say strange fire. Strange fire sounds really peculiar. You know, why is it strange? Fire is fire, right? Uh, and um, we don't know the mindset of Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, but we see the consequences of it. Uh, we see that the Lord immediately kills them uh, for what they did, this unauthorized fire. Now let's uh, keep on reading there, um, and I, I think it'll kind of tie together here in a little bit. Um, in verse 2, the fire came out from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Then it says in verse 4, And Moses called Mishael and Elazaphan, the sons of Uziel, and the, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near and carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So they came near uh, and carried them out in their coats and out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar uh, and to Ithamar, his sons, Do not let the hair of your heads loose, and do not tear your clothes, lest you die, and the wrath come upon all the congregation. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning that the Lord has kindled. Uh, and do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing of the oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Um, so... You, you see the, the aftermath immediately after they are killed. And Moses immediately says to Aaron, do not, do not mourn them. Do not be angry. Be very careful how you go about your next move. Uh, and so it shows the seriousness, not just of what Nadab and Abihu did, but also how the people would react to it. Uh, and then if you look at the, the next uh, verse there, um, Moses gives Aaron some insight uh, in verse uh, 8, the Lord uh, spoke to Aaron, excuse me, it was, it was uh, the Lord speaking, saying, Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. You are to distinguish uh, between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken. It would appear that God speaks to Aaron immediately after this and gives them a warning about what has just happened. Um, many of the, the various scholars believe that, that the verse there where he says, uh, let this be a warning to you to not have any strong drink before you go before the Lord, uh, and that that's possibly what had happened, that uh, Nadab and Abihu uh, had consumed alcohol of some sort, and they went and took fire from a place that was not authorized. Um, God had specifically given them instructions about how to light uh, the, the fire, and it was to be taken from the coal uh, from the, uh, the brass altar uh, that had been made for the, the worship of the Lord and from the sacrifice of atonement. And so they were to take tongs, and they were to go get a, a coal out of that fire uh, that was for the sins of the people, and they were to go use that to make this fire with. Uh, apparently, they got it from some other source. That's what makes it unauthorized fire. Uh, and, and so, in doing so, 
the Lord's anger was kindled and he consumed them immediately by fire. Um, it's one of those times where you see uh, an instant uh, judgment on the people or an instant judgment on Nadab and Abihu, similar to, um, to in the New Testament where we have um, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they're, they're immediately punished for their sin. Uh, there's other instances like um, uh, Uzziah, uh, or not Uzzah, uh, it, where he tried to steady the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and it was being carried in a way that it shouldn't have been to begin with. It was never to be laid on a, a cart and pulled behind an ox. It was supposed to be carried through the ringlets uh, by the priest. Uh, and so the situation was unauthorized, and when Uzziah went to, to steady it, uh, it, he was killed by the Lord. And it seems like a harsh... Uh, judgment because they were offering fire to the Lord. They were, uh, they were still in the process of worshiping him. They weren't giving a, a sacrifice to some unknown God or to, to Baal or something like that, but it was in a way that God had not authorized, and therefore uh, it was very severe. Uh, and uh, oftentimes when we think of the, the practical application, I always like to look at how does this affect me? How does this story affect my life as a New Testament Christian? Well, the, the fact is God means what he says. Uh, he told Adam and Eve they could have everything else but do not eat of the one tree. And they ate of the tree and they sat, uh, suffered the punishment because of it. Um, and so God means what he says and he takes sin very seriously. And sometimes I think we get a little casual with the idea of sin. But God views anything outside of what his mark is to miss the mark, harmatia. Uh, which is what sin is. And, and so God takes it seriously, and we need to take it seriously as well. Uh, and if we realize that we have done wrong, we should be thankful we have an opportunity to repent. Nadab and Abihu were not given the opportunity to repent. Uh, and so it, it definitely affects, uh, you know, if, if we look at God's word in the New Testament, what is he authorized? Are we doing anything outside of what he's authorized? Uh, and, and we have to be very careful with that. Yeah, it's a really good answer, you know, without getting to the ins and outs of Levitical law and, and such. I think the practical application, like you mentioned, is that God expects obedience and that God expects um, specific obedience, right? You know, uh, we hear people say all the time, well, you know, at least, I'm, at least I'm going to church somewhere. At least I'm praising God, even if I don't necessarily do it in the way that the Bible teaches. Well, um, that, that's unacceptable. And, you know, we even hear sometimes when people talk about un unauthorized forms of worship, well, it's strange fire. And certainly that's an allusion to that. And so our best bet is to obey God exactly. Just like we talked about this morning with Abraham, uh, just like we talked about in the past with Noah. Uh, you know, I, I've asked kids all the time in Bible class, well, what if Noah would have built the ark out of some wood besides gopher wood? What would happen to the ark? Well, it would have sunk because God expects exact uh, obedience. Uh, and so, yeah, good answer. I didn't know we were sneaking in other PowerPoints into this thing tonight. That's fancy. Give me this back. All right, uh, question number three. Um, you can go ahead and be open into 1 Corinthians 12. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? And then we'll answer part two in just a minute. But go ahead and turn your Bible over there, 1 Corinthians 12. By the way, while we're turning there, let me give you a little plug. Uh, these questions that were submitted are really good. All of these questions were submitted by a couple of, of people, and so um, I would love for more of you to contribute. If there is a follow-up question from tonight, send that in to me. We'll answer it next time. If you have a question completely unrelated, no matter how off the wall you think the question might be, uh, we want to deal with it. We would love to answer it. We'd love to, to take a stab at it. And so please send those questions in. This is going to be a monthly thing uh, moving forward, and so uh, please get us those questions if you can, we, we really enjoy uh, answering. And sometimes they're a, a challenge um, for us as well. So, um, yeah, we're in 2 Corinthians 12, excuse me. I knew that wasn't right. 2 Corinthians 12. Um, so here, what's going on in 2 Corinthians 12 is, is a few things. Uh, first off, Paul here has this vision of going to heaven. And we've had lessons about this before. They're questioning Paul's uh, apostolic authority in 2 Corinthians. And, uh, and, you know, and, and so he says that here, I'm going to boast for him. I'm going to talk about things. And he says that, uh, that there was a man, and we know that the man he's referring to is, is himself, uh, and he got to go up and see into heaven a little bit. He got a, a vision, uh, and he says he couldn't describe it. Uh, and so 
in, in, the, in the context of that discussion, though, he says in verse 4, I was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I, what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Okay, so Paul says here um, that, that he is given something. A, a thorn in the flesh. Uh, and so there has been great debate about what this could possibly be. A thorn in the flesh. What was it that, that bothered Paul? And it says he prayed to the Lord three times that it would go away. So we know it's something sig significant. Some have posited that it was actually a person that was a thorn in the flesh. Now, uh, where I come from, we call that person a pain in the behind, not a thorn in the flesh, but maybe that's what it was for Paul. Uh, maybe, maybe it was a person, and there have been different people that have been suggested that were, um, that were his thorn in the flesh. Some people have suggested it was emotional, um, that maybe it was his distress that he faced constantly, or maybe it was um, some emotional ailment that, that he faced. But what most people tend to believe is that it was some sort of physical um, ailment, some sort of uh, disability that he had. Some people have suggested that it was malaria. Uh, some have suggested that it was uh, some, some other illness that he came uh, in contact with, uh, uh, um, some sort of disease that plagued him for the rest of his life. Um, the common accepted thing, the thing that we know about Paul is that he had trouble with his eyesight. Uh, there are countless examples in the Gospels where he would use an amanuensis, which is a fancy way of saying a scribe or a secretary, to write down uh, things for him. A couple of times he says, this part of the letter I'm actually writing in my own hand, uh, indicating that another person had written most of it. In Galatians, uh, we read that he wrote in a, in a larger print. Uh, there's actually a, a place in Acts where Paul is there and um, he sees, he says something and they say, why would you talk to the high priest like that? And he says, well, I didn't recognize that it was the high priest. And so people think that he was having trouble with his eyesight even then. And so what we don't know then was the thorn in the flesh blindness or was the blindness associated with some other disability or did Paul not even care about the blindness and was this thorn in the flesh something else that was more significant to him than lacking the ability to see? And, and the answer is we just don't know. This is one of those things like uh, who wrote Hebrews that people have debated and argued and they've searched for proof about. But the second part of this question I think is really good. And the question was, if, if Paul's eyesight was his thorn in the flesh, could it be related to him being blinded on the road to Damascus? Could those scale-like things that were on his eyes, could they have caused permanent uh, vision uh, impairment? And I just don't know the answer to that. I think it's a really cool question. We don't see any biblical evidence of that, but, but it could be uh, that that's true. And so um, we don't know, but we do know that Paul uh, battled trouble with his eyesight. And so that's the best answer I can give that, that probably the thorn in the flesh was related to his eyesight, but it could have been something else that where the eyesight was just a secondary um, consequence of that. But I'm, I'm really thankful for that question. That's one that um, we'll just have to wait till we get to heaven and ask Paul. And I imagine there'll be a line of people there asking him, all right, Paul, what's this thorn in the flesh thing that you had going on? Good answer. Nothing to add to that, huh? Um, yeah, there, a lot of people have speculated that it was something like cataracts when he was uh, received his sight uh, and it was like scales that fell from his eyes. And cataracts are described, you know, as they're removed are like scales. Um, but uh, all the other instances of healing that we have in the New Testament, they were a complete healing. Now, whether or not the Lord chose to use this in a different way, I mean, obviously the Lord can do what he wants to and, and had the power to whether or not Ananias, he says receive your sight. He doesn't say receive your partial sight. But uh, it does lend itself well to the, at least the theory of it. And uh, I think the, the main key is that it goes back to the fact 
that uh, this is given to him to keep him humble uh, in the face of, you know, it'd be easy to boast saying, hey, I've been to heaven. You know, uh, I, I know what it's like. Look at me. And, and many times Paul uh, had experiences that he could have boasted about. Uh, you know, the fact that he was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, the fact that he had been beaten and left for dead, uh, all the different stripes that he had received. Um, he had reasons that humanly we would tend to want to boast about. Uh, you know, look at me. But this was designed to keep him humble. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it was a, a person, obviously Paul experienced a number of people who were, uh, who were hard on him. In Philippians he talks about that some are opposing him and even uh, mocking him, but he's thankful that they're proclaiming Christ even though uh, that they're opposing him. Uh, and so the, the life of Paul was not an easy one. None of the apostles had it easy just because they had the miraculous Holy Spirit. Um, all of them died for what they believed in, except for uh, John, at least, uh, and he was uh, exiled to the Isle of Patmos. So uh, it, it's definitely something that is designed to, uh, to keep him humble, and uh, whatever it was, uh, many, many people think it's his eyesight, and I think it, he definitely struggled with his eyesight, whether that's the, the end result that he's referring to here or not. Yeah, and we, we know, I mean, Paul's a pretty tough dude, right? If you go back in chapter 11, um, you know, starting in verse uh, 23, he says, I've been flogged, I've been exposed to death, I got uh, 40 lashes minus one five times, three times I was beaten with rods, I got pelted with stones. And by the way, in that context, I believe that Paul actually died and was resurrected because typically when they stone you, they don't stone you until you're unconscious. You were stoned to death. And so uh, Paul goes through that stoning, which is an awful thing. He was shipwrecked. Not just once, not just twice, but three times. I think I would have stopped getting on boats after time number two, personally. But three times he shipwrecked. Um, he spent a night and a day in the open sea, constantly on the move, in danger from rivers, bandits, um, from fellow Jews, Gentiles, city, uh, in the, excuse me, um, in the city, in the country, in the sea, from false believers. He's had all this stuff. He's been hungry and thirsty. And so whatever this one thing was, he obviously considers it worse than all those things. So it would have had to have been something that really was a struggle for him. And so, um, like I said, we don't know, we do know that he struggled with his eyesight and whether that's the uh, whole problem, we don't know. All right, next question for- you know, on that stone and left for dead, he gets up and goes back into the same town. Yeah. I would at least gone the next town over, uh, <laughs> but he's, he was a tough dude. That's right. Um, Romans chapter four, verse 15 begs a question for us, Caleb. Um, and, and, and the example that's given here is one that's been, um, proposed a lot, but it, it is worth discussing. Um, will people be saved if they have never heard the gospel? And the example that's given here would be, um, there are very few, but a couple of tribes, um, specifically in the Amazon that have been uncontacted by people. And, and you will get in trouble if you do that. And there was very famously a story a couple of years ago about a Christian missionary who went and contacted one of these tribes. And as soon as they saw him, they instantly killed him because they didn't want him to be there. Um, and that would, they were very hostile towards that. And so the question is, will people be saved if they've never heard the gospel? Romans 4.15. Okay, so let's look at Romans 4.15. And uh, the, the question here is often brought up, uh, usually in a study of, of baptism and salvation. And it seems like we always find the most extreme uh, situation to discuss. You know, what if somebody dies on the way to being baptized? And, uh, and sometimes we can get really caught up in tangents. But... I believe there's some pretty straightforward answers about this uh, that may be a little hard for us at times. First of all, uh, if you think about when we approach a worldview and we talk about a, uh, an uncontacted tribe in the Amazon, well, if we take a biblical standpoint, every one of them came from Adam and from Noah. And so they may be uncontacted today by modern means and things like that, but they're all descendants of... Adam and Noah. So now that we've got that established, let's look at what Romans chapter 4 verse 15 says there. Uh, and he says, um, in, uh, for the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay, so the, the premise then would be in this argument is if they don't know about the law, and Paul's referring to the Old Testament law, uh, if, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Is there sin outside of, or if you don't know about the Scripture, is it living in sin? And will they be judged because they've never heard 
the gospel. They've never heard about Jesus. They don't know about these things. Will they be judged because of it? Uh, well, first, let's look at John chapter 14, verse 6. And this is in Jesus' own words uh, where he says, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to me, except, comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus makes a very emphatic statement, uh, and he says, you cannot get to God the Father, you cannot get to heaven without going through me. Uh, so that's the first thing in Jesus' own words. Uh, the second one, Peter says something very similar in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. He says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Jesus said it first, Peter repeats it, there's no other way to get to heaven. So even though they may be outside of the law, do they, uh, are they going to be judged accordingly? Well, first of all, I want to get this out there. I'm not God. I'm not the judge. Uh, they're going to have to stand before a righteous and just God, and he will be righteous and just with them, just like he will be with us. Uh, and if he chooses to change uh, his words, uh, God is unchanging, so we're ha going to have to take what his word says about it. Uh, but there's other uh, things that, that remind us of this. Um, the importance, the first thing that I see out of this is uh, that uh, Ham, Shem, and Japheth had an obligation. In fact, when they come out of the ark, they're given uh, a, sort of a, um, not a threatening, but they're told, make sure that you pass this on to the generation after you and the generation after them, and that you continue to teach God's word. What we see is many places around the world, they didn't do that. They didn't follow through with teaching the generation after them and the generation after that. And so because of that, you have people who spread out all over the world that taught false things, false religions. Uh, and you would think coming out of the ark and being the only people that survived that, you know, immediately you would have made sure that that passed on and, and that generations after that. But really, um, I think it's only the second generation after the ark where they build the Tower of Babel and they're trying to... Their premise is they're going to build a tower to reach heaven. Uh, they want to overthrow God. And some scholars believe that, that that's their anger in their reaction to the flood. That they are, you know, how could God wipe out the earth? We're going to try to figure out a way to get to him. And, uh, and their audacity in that is why they are confounded. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 uh, is where Paul is writing to the church and he says... Uh, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven uh, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing vengeance on them that, notice the wording here, that know not God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Um, the, the fact is, is that we've been given a command as New Testament Christians to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so we have a responsibility to do our very best to reach anyone and everyone with the truth. And God will be their judge in the day of judgment. And it's, it's kind of a hard thing for us as humans because we want to rationalize it. Well, if they didn't know, then should they be punished because of it? And, and, and you know, we, we kind of get into this sort of uh, justification type mindset. But God is very emphatic about his word. And if they don't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior, uh, then according to the word, there is no other way to the Father. And so that's the only thing that we can go on. Uh, it, it may seem on the surface as uh, something that's kind of hard and difficult to, to deal with, uh, but the fact is is that, that uh, the psalmist talks about how that we can know that there is a God from the creation. Uh, we can see the invisible witness of his hands. We, we know that there is an almighty creator. And so uh, he's going to be their judge in the day of judgment, and he's going to be a righteous judge. Uh, but the word is what's going to judge the world. So. Yeah, um, so I wrestle with this. You know, um, I, I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit fascinated by this idea that in 2020, you know, we're sitting here um, and, uh, you know, we, we've got this microphone. Could you imagine being uh, somebody who's out there uh, living out in the jungle, you know, wearing essentially a loincloth or even if they wear any kind of clothes and, you know, with this very primitive communication and primitive tools and, you know, makeshift bow and arrow, and then somebody comes out there and is talking with a microphone, you would think that that was the voice of God booming down, right? Um, or, 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 you know, we're sitting here with, with cell phones, and we have Wi-Fi in the building, you know, just yet there's people who, who are still living in that. And so I think it's fascinating. I think there's a, there's a nobility to that, I guess. Um, but, but it's almost sad to think that we have this world 
with all its advantages, but they haven't been exposed to it. It makes me think about a movie that was, I think it was called The Village, one of those M. Night Shyamalan movies that came out, and they had these people living, uh, you know, like it was still the 17 or 1800s, and then one day they escape, and they go through these bushes, and it's just the modern, the modern world, right? And so, um, you know, and it, I guess it sounds kind of harsh what we're saying here, but if you read Romans chapter 1, this is the same letter that we're, that we're looking from. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. That we have to have within us the understanding that this world had a creator, and it's our job to seek him out and, and find him. And so... Um, yeah, that's, that's a great answer to that question. Um, let me borrow that clicker for one second. So we had one more question. I'm going to answer it in about a minute, and then we'll pick back up with this one next time. Mark 15, 21, we read about Simon of Cyrene. He was the man who was conscripted to carry the cross of Jesus. And it asked, why was he in Jerusalem? The very short answer, he was in Jerusalem to worship. Uh, he would have been there um, to worship, even though he was not uh, someone who lived there. We'll look more at that next time. And then in Mark 15, 21, it says he has two sons, Rufus and Alexander. And then when you get to Romans chapter 16, verse 3, um, Paul is writing about um, some people who are great, pe great people of service. And he mentions a man named Rufus. And Rufus's mother became a, a great friend to Paul. And so the question is, is Rufus uh, the same man that is a son of Simon, Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene that's mentioned in Romans 16, 3? The short answer is this, we think so. But there's no way to actually prove that. But most people um, from the conservative and, and on down um, that in the scholarly field believe that, that that's probably the case, that uh, being a witness of those things as Rufus was would have made him loyal to the cause of Christ and that he would have uh, been, been part of the work. Uh, but, but we don't have a definitive proof of that. We'll, we'll spend a little bit more time to start on this one. Uh, in uh, our next uh, session in September, and then we'll have a few more questions. Once again, please uh, submit those questions so that we can have them to answer for you uh, next time. Uh, in the form of, of offering an invitation, I want you to turn to Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. Caleb, you have any closing thoughts? No. No. That's good. Man, a few words. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, about this question and answer thing, and I, I really like it. Um, and it makes me think about um, Acts 17 where it talks about the Bereans and it says that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they sought the scriptures daily to see if what the preachers were saying was true. And, and it's this idea of seeking. Um, I've, I've been super into over the last, uh, really the last few years and even, even lately over the last few months, uh, crime dramas and crime documentaries. Um, there's a podcast called Crime Junkie that I listen to sometimes when I'm riding down the road. And if you go on Netflix right now, they're popular, these documentaries about the mob and about um, the people that are the most wanted in the world. And I mentioned one in the bulletin today, uh, Felician Kabuga, who was finally arrested. But it's amazing uh, how much money and really how much money you and I as taxpayers uh, contribute to seeking out criminals. Um, millions upon millions of dollars to go and seek out and find these people to, to bring them to justice. Um, and when, when, you, when you go out there, everybody in life is seeking something, whether we're seeking out a criminal or seeking out meaning or seeking, um, you know, someone to, to be in a relationship with, seeking out love, wh whatever it is that we're seeking, we're, we're all looking for something. And it really made me think about this verse that, that, we, that we quote all the time and that we sing about, Matthew six thirty three, seek first, what, what should I be seeking more than anything in the world? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Those two things we should be seeking out, seeking his kingdom. And you and I here tonight, if we're Christians, we found his kingdom and his righteousness or the way to live in that kingdom. If we can seek his kingdom and his righteousness, then everything else that we need in life will be added to us, that everything else will be sufficient, that God will take care of us. And so tonight, you know, I'm so proud of these questions because that means that people have been seeking deeper answers from the scripture. And so tonight, I, I just want to throw this out there. If you're seeking something, we have the answers. Maybe not Caleb and I, because there are a lot of questions tonight we didn't know the answer to. 
but, but God is the answer to what ails you in your life. If you're struggling with, with some private sin, go to God and make it right. If you're struggling with something publicly, we had three that responded to the invitation this morning and uh, we're so thankful to them, to, to David and to Patsy and to Joanne for having that heart of wanting to respond publicly. We'd love to sit here with you and, and through tears, we'll pray with you and pray for you and help you in any way that we can. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, there is a void in your life, whether you know it or not, and you're seeking something. And the answer comes through the sacrifice of Christ. If you're willing to confess that he's the son of God, repent of your sins and be baptized so those sins can be washed away, you can find the answer to what you're looking for tonight. If you have any need, come as we stand and as we sing. just want to uh, remind you about the things that were mentioned. I know we had some uh, announcements in the bulletin. Make sure that you're paying attention to those. We won't rehash those. Remember those that uh, are sick, have things coming up. We, we added this morning um, Holly Barr to our list. She's supposed to be having a, a biopsy this week, but she called me right before service started and said that um, she may have possibly been exposed to COVID at work. Um, and in the school system, we're, we're seeing a lot more of that. I actually got a, a message today that... Um, Creekview High School, where Daniel Sisson is a teacher, is actually shutting down uh, until the end of the month because of, uh, of so many concerns there. And so uh, she's going to have to figure out if she's going to be able to do that or not. So please keep Holly in your prayers. We also got a message, and I don't know if this got to you or not, but um, Gail and um, Judy and Clea's brother, David, uh, is going to have um, some pretty big tests coming up, um, some kidney and liver problems. He's actually in the hospital now, right? And so I'm um, going to be trying to make some big decisions about his future. So if you remember David Smith uh, in your prayers, I know that they would appreciate that. And uh, Caleb, do you have something to add? Um, I'll turn you on there. there we go. Uh, also, um, uh, several of you noticed this afternoon, uh, Steve Higginbotham, who you may know through Polishing the Pulpit or uh, that also is the director of the uh, East Tennessee School of Preaching uh, he um, made the announcement today that he has stage four cancer in multiple places in his body. Uh, so please keep him in your prayers uh, as they uh, meet with uh, the doctor and try to figure out uh, the prognosis of that and, and uh, if there's a plan to go forward. Um, next Sunday evening uh, on the 23rd, uh, it will be five minutes with an elder. Uh, and we're going to have the, the elders up here. Jeremy, you want to explain that a little bit more? Yeah, um, we uh, are going to have each one of the elders share um, about, um, not about, exactly five minutes, because we're going to have a stopwatch. <laughs> exactly five minutes uh, of, of some Mark thoughts. Mark it. Yeah, that's right. Um, and Mark gets ten. Everybody else gets five. No, uh, but, um, you know, our, our, our theme for the year is love one another. And, um, man, it, it's appropriate that that's what it is, because, there, there have been a lot of times in, uh, in the world where people have really struggled with the idea of loving one another. And so they have put a lot of time and effort into that theme and into studying the scriptures related to that. And uh, they're going to have some wisdom and some insights to share with us. And I mentioned this this morning that the elders have been given the task divinely from God 
to, to shape the spiritual direction of our church and to lead us in the way that we should go. And so they're going to share some thoughts next week. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing what they have to say. And um, uh, we, we appreciate all the work and the study that they've put into that. Uh, this Wednesday night, Cody Bearden will be here for uh, the summer series. Uh, so please keep that in mind and hope you can be back with us on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, and then uh, Sunday afternoon, next Sunday, is the open house at our house. You're welcome to come on Saturday, but we won't be ready for the open house. So um, I can guarantee you that with five kids running around. Um, so Sunday uh, in the afternoon, I believe from 2 to 5, come and go uh, as you want to. And come and enjoy the, the fellowship with us and, and uh, see the house and the property and, and everything. Um, what, kind, what kind of snacks are you going to have? Uh, good food. Okay. I believe we got some help with that. So uh it's the Church of Christ. We're always going to have good food. That's, that goes without saying. Um, the, uh, there's an area preachers meeting here at the building tomorrow via Zoom uh, and for the elders as well. Uh, and really open to anybody that would like to come and, yeah. and sit in on that. Uh, I was asked to remind everybody the congratulations to Russell, Russell Cochran on his graduation from the University of Georgia. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a number that have gone off to college, and we can definitely see that in the, our attendance, and, and we wish all of them well uh, as they've gone off to school. Uh, but definitely keep them in your prayers as they're uh, back in the groove, and especially with all the, the new changes and the new things that they're experiencing off at college. Yeah, I, I want to mention too about Russell. We recognized all our graduates, and um, I had hoped that we would have occasion for Russell to be back so that we could recognize him. He has moved off to California all of a sudden, but um, and it's going to be a while before he gets to go back. And so we, uh, we will be sending Russell a gift as well. And uh, congratulations to Russell graduating from the University of Georgia. I joke that it's pretty easy and they let anybody do it, but it's actually a pretty big accomplishment. So we're really proud of Russell and uh, really proud of the adventure he has set off on, uh, on his own. So. Uh, congratulations to Russell. Just remember really quickly, if you didn't have an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, it'll be ready in the room to the right. Barry's going to lead us in a closing song, and then Jacob will dismiss us in prayer unless you have anything else. Ladies Bible study on Tuesday. Uh, please take advantage of that if you can. And Thursday night, the uh, Roundtable devotional podcast will be on um, forgiveness, uh, and we will have the speaker from this last week on our uh, Wednesday night summer series uh, who joined us. Uh, for that, the uh, the roundtable podcast. If you if you watch it, if you like it, if you will share it, uh, that helps it get to more people. I think the first episode had about, um, about two thousand views, uh, and uh, between Facebook and uh, YouTube. So, uh, and a lot of people have sent us comments of that they really appreciated it. Uh, so, if you would share that with others when you uh, see it, so that more people can uh, be benefited by that. come before you today. We want to thank you for what a wonderful day you gave us to worship you and to come here and worship you and fellowship with others. And Lord, at this time, I want to ask you to be with our country and be with the leaders as they're making decisions right now that will affect us years down the road and let you be the light that they follow in those decisions. And Lord, we want to ask you to be with the police and be with the armed forces as they're going out and they're risking our, their lives to protect us and we want to always show them the most respect that we can. And Lord, bring us back here at our next point in time and let us have a great rest of the week. In your son's name we pray, amen.